Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Anne-Marie Slaughter and Alicia Menendez. Thanks for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, to, na to name just a few. We have over 150 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now we're honored to welcome Dr. Slaughter back to Fanland. We hosted her for an October 2015 event for her book, Unfinished Business, Women, Men, Work and Family. She is the CEO of New America, a think and action tank dedicated to renewing America in the digital age. She is also the Burt Kerstetter 66 University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. From 2019 to 2011, Dr. Slaughter served as Director of Policy Planning for the State Department, the first woman to hold that position. Prior to her government positions, she was the Dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs from 2002 to 2009, and the Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International, Foreign and Comparative Law at Harvard Law School from 1994 to 2002. Dr. Slaughter has written or edited many books, including The Chessboard and the Web, The Idea That Is America, and A New World Order, as well as over 100 scholarly articles. Alicia Menendez is the weekend anchor of MSNBC's American Voices with Alicia Menendez. She's also the author of The Likeability Trap, How to Break Free and Succeed as You Are, and she's the host of the Latina to Latina podcast. Prior to joining MSNBC, Menendez served as a correspondent of Amanpour and Company on PBS and formerly hosted a nightly news and pop culture show on Fusion called Alicia Menendez Tonight. Her reporting and interviews have appeared on ABC News, Bustle, Fusion TV, PBS, and Vice News. We're now thrilled to welcome Anne-Marie Slaughter and Alicia Menendez. Lonnie, thank you so much. You made that easy for us. Hi, Dr. Slaughter. I'm excited to do this with you. Alicia, it's great to do this with you as well. And do please call me Anne Marie. Okay. Well, I, I just want to say, I want to be completely <laughs> candid with everyone that you saw me five minutes ago backstage in my mom gear. So I hope you appreciate the superwoman change that has I happened definitely do. <laughs> in your honor and in your steed. Um, as you know, I was an early reader of Renewal and I loved it. I resonated with me very personally. And, and I think a big part of that is that you you take a big risk at the at the beginning of the book, which is you could have made this a completely conceptual, esoteric, you know, waxing philosophical book about politics in the moment, but you instead chose to make it very personal. And so I would love for you to take us back to the initial moment of crisis that you use both to shape the book, but also to shape the fundamental thought that underlies the book. Yes, uh, the, you know, the opening line of the book is, it was the worst day of my professional life. And even now, having written the book, uh, when I say that and I think back, my stomach tightens. I, we uh, were New America, the organization I lead was in a full blown, media crisis and we had been accused of firing an employee due to pressure from a funder. Uh, and I, when I thought about starting there, on the one hand, the last thing I want to do is to go back to that crisis and relitigate it. I, do, I didn't do what I was accused of, but I made a lot of mistakes. And when you're a leader, you know, the fact that your organization is under attack uh, and you're not able to defend it adequately, it doesn't really, you know, the rest doesn't matter. It was up to me. Uh, and I start with facing my employees and having to apologize that we had ended up in this situation. And then essentially going forward from that moment uh, and the, the book sort of carries that, that through, and I thought long and hard, obviously, about starting there. I did because in the first place, that really is the beginning of the journey of renewal that I am describing. And I talk about radical honesty in the book. I talk about facing yourself. So I couldn't leave that out. That, that's really where it, it started for me. And at the same time, I also did learn from the article that I published in The Atlantic in 2012 on why women still can't have it all, 
if that article had been only a kind of policy article talking about the data of what women are going through, it would not have had nearly the resonance. I read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of narrative nonfiction. And I wanted to try to write a book that would draw people in, that would allow them to see themselves in it. If you're a leader, if you're anybody who's gone through a really big personal crisis, and most of us have, uh, and then use that as a portal to questions of organizational renewal. Many of us are in organizations that are examining themselves. Uh, and then national renewal, which I, uh, you know, I've been working on for a long time and believe passionately that we need. You're going to be, I'm going to be muted anytime I'm not talking so that I save everyone the screams of my children <laughs> that are happening as they, as they protest bedtime. Um, you are familiar, you know. <laughs> One of the points that you make early in renewal and that, of course, I found particularly compelling because of my own work is that women leaders in particular are not given opportunities to fail. And women leaders are not given the opportunity to face a crisis and then emerge a stronger, better, more seasoned leader. What does that mean for leadership, for women? And, and, and how do we create the space for people to make mistakes or to not do it perfectly and still get a shot at doing it again? You know, so on the one hand, everything you said is true. And I never processed this crisis as particularly sexist, although some of the men in my, who work with me, who report to me did, interestingly. They were the ones who said, you know, I just don't think this would be happening in the same way. Uh, if you were a woman, if you were not a woman. And certainly I've been in other settings where that's definitely been true, where I've, you know, I've gotten all the same criticisms that all women leaders get uh, and all the double standards. So, you know, if you're forceful and assertive, like, it, like a man would lead, you, you are, all sorts of bad words are said as a family action show. So I'm not gonna... <laughs> I'm it's not, okay. Everyone know knows the words you're yeah, talking everyone about. Everyone knows the word I'm talking about. Um, and I do believe all that. But I also say in this book, when I'm talking about, um, I, I talk about running toward the criticism, which is actually advice I got from David Bradley, who used to. Which, by the way, just you, when the first time I read it, and now when you say it again, my hands sweat automatically at the idea <laughs> of running toward criticism. It's the opposite <laughs> of what we are taught to do. It is. Although, so he was on my board. And I called him during the midst of this crisis. And he said, and we both knew I was in trouble. And he said, I didn't put this in the book, but he said, imagine you're having an argument with your spouse. And it is absolutely clear that your spouse is 98% wrong, just flat out wrong. We've all had those arguments. But maybe your spouse is 2% right. There might be just a tiny grain of truth in whatever your spouse is accusing you of. He said, run toward that. And, and then that's the beginning of a learning journey. And I did, I, I called all my board members, I talked to my staff and to answer your question, one of the things I did was to go back to Shirley Tillman, uh, who was president of Princeton when I was Dean of what was the Woodrow Wilson School. It's now the School of Public and International Affairs. And I, I had had a very successful tenure as Dean but then later, I hadn't been appointed interim dean, which is frankly, it's like first prize is interim dean for a year and second prize is interim dean for two years. It's not, it's not fun, but it's still expected. And so I went back to talk to her and she told me things ab about how I had led uh, that were problematic. Now, half of me is thinking exactly what you just said, that a lot of the criticisms that, that, that I heard from her, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. If, you know, if I'd been a man, that would not have been how various people reacted. But at the same time, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, she herself, she was the first woman president of Princeton and really a pioneer. She didn't, she just was different from any other president Princeton had had in gender and other ways. And she led beautifully. 
so I, I, on the one hand, think you have to constantly push back against those stereotypes and you have to constantly insist, hey, wait a minute, I get a chance to fail. On the other hand, you can't let what you know to be the double standard prevent you from really looking hard inside yourself and seeing real flaws, whether they would be flaws in other people or not. Uh, and then growing from them, because the core core is really that doing that is how you grow. We, we talked a little bit about the personal piece. What you're trying to do, though, is extrapolate from the personal to the organizational, to the national, to the global. So let's start with the organizational piece. What do you see as the opportunity of this moment? Perhaps a better question actually is, what did you see as the opportunity of this moment when you were writing the book? Because a lot has transpired between when you handed in that manuscript and when you and I are speaking right now. Yes, yes. Uh, I handed in the manuscript in January of this year. I'm trying to remember, uh, January, February, but, but yes, I mean, the pandemic had happened, George Floyd's murder had happened, the summer of 2020 hit New America like it hit every other organization. Uh, and one of the things that happened then, which paralleled what the story I was telling, but definitely deepened my own understanding of what, of what I was going through and the country was going through, was the, the sense George Floyd is murdered and there's pressure on a lot of organizations to issue statements. New America rarely issues statements because we're a very diverse place and we don't have an institutional point of view, but this time, absolutely. And as we're drafting the statement and it's condemning systemic racism, as you might imagine, Tyra Mariani, who was my president at that point, and one of the lessons I learned was to share power. So she's my president and she says to me, you know, I can tell you what many of our employees of color are gonna think if we put this out and I can tell you what they're thinking in think tanks all over town. They're thinking you're all about condemning the systemic racism out there, but you won't see much less condemn the racism in here. And that is exactly where I think a lot of organizations are. And I can parallel this as a woman where if you did the same thing with sexism, I would be thinking, absolutely, you know, you, you, can, you can see, uh, you know, the, the speck in somebody else's eye, but not the beam in your own from the biblical uh, quote. Uh, but, you know, nobody wants to face it. It's very hard. And often the very people who are experiencing racism or marginalization don't have a way to talk about it. Tyra was my president, so she could just say it. And we changed our statement, but more importantly, we started a process that is absolutely ongoing of not only educating ourselves about racism, but getting to the point where people can actually talk about what's happening to them day to day. And it's right. hard. Right. And, and especially because that burden can't fall on people of color Definitely. exclusively. Um, tell me what it looks like to share power. <laughs> So this is one of the big lessons that I learned, and I really do advocate for as many leaders as possible. You know, I had been president and CEO, and typically today you're president and CEO, and I had Tyra had been my executive vice president or COO. You can, you know, many different, the, the sort of number two. And I realized that in part, she was gonna go be a president somewhere. So why not be a president at New America? I didn't wanna lose her. So why do, and so I thought, well, okay, I'll be CEO, you be president. And, and she was then president and COO. But more importantly, it really it was, and is now with my current president, a sharing of power in the sense that I have formal authority. I mean, in theory, I can lay down the law or, and, and it, it's never happened, but if we came to a decision where the organization was really riven and she and I or Paul and I disagreed, then I'd have to make the final call. That's never happened. What happens is that it's it's a partnership. It is, you know, some of it you it, it was very hard at first. I remember the first time she chaired a meeting that I had chaired, and I I essentially sidelined myself. I was sitting at the side of the table and she's chairing, and I'm thinking, what have I done? But the the 
the pleasure of having a partner and a sounding board and of, of essentially putting the organization not only on your shoulders, but on someone else's at the same time. And the, the fact that all oh, lots of people would talk to her would never have talked to me. So I heard lots of things that I was not going to hear. I had a much better sense of the organization and vice versa, right? So we, we often would kind of mediate the various tensions that we were facing, but we had enough trust between us uh, to be able to talk things out. And I'll just say it, it has made leadership infinitely more fun. I love it. It's so... It, it, it speaks to all of the things that scare me most about running an enterprise or running, which is just like it, <laughs> how can one person make every decision? How can one person have their finger on the pulse of everything that is happening? I would love to see that model applied more exactly. broadly. Because they don't. The answer is they don't. They depend on their team. And that's the issue. If somebody's a COO, meaning that you are letting them, you're entrusting them with all the operations of the, the place, why not split that job? Why not bump that person up to president? Why do you have to have both? It would open up so much more leadership room also, if you think about, you know, just another top spot. Uh, you're, and you're not going to pay them much more because you're already they're already a top person. That's that's the thing. The people in the C-suite are often co-leaders. They're just. I not wonder, given the experience you have, is that how the federal government often ends up operating, just de facto, because the portfolios are too big, because it is impossible for yes, of course, the the buck stops with the president of the United States, and he, for example, fundamentally makes some of those decisions. But a certain amount of that responsibility does have to be shared. Oh yes. I mean, it's certainly, I'm just thinking it's it's shared among political appointees. If I think about when Secretary Clinton was Secretary of State, um, certainly, you know, she had a deputy secretary of state. She has her counselor and her chief of staff and her deputy chief of staff. I mean, the, a good chief of staff and the principal are partners because they know each other extremely well and they have to trust each other. And the chief of staff has a lot of experience. That is particularly true if the chief of staff uh, or somebody high up is, is for a member of the foreign service or the civil service. So it's like, yes, minister in Britain, right? We don't have that permanent civil service in the same way, but you need institutional memory and you have to trust the folks you know, who've been in the building for a long time. You also have to push on them. That's this partnership because it can't, you're not abdicating your job, um, but you are actively sharing the decision making again my board really wanted their, they didn't want us to be co-ceos because they thought that gets very messy and formally you, there has to be one person where the buck stops as i said in practice i have never had to to exert that power so all of this i would say is is prelude to the grand question which is how one applies this concept of renewal to to a nation. I will also say I have a thousand questions for Anne-Marie, but if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A because otherwise I will completely monopolize her time. But <laughs> again, there is this push and pull in time. So I want to go back to you handing in your manuscript and in that moment, how you saw the personal lesson that you had experience applying to the national discourse, and then we'll bring ourselves to today. Yeah. Yes. Um, so again, I handing in the manuscript at the beginning of the Biden administration, a sense that we had averted disaster. I'm, just spoke, I'll speak for myself here, by the skin of our teeth in the November election, then January 6th, which of course is truly terrifying. And I was running a meeting with all my Washington staff while it's happening. And I realized that everybody's looking at CNN rather than the Zoom screen. And I live in Princeton, so I wasn't there, but many of them were right there with frightened children, you know, and the television's blaring and all of that. But even after that, a sense of, you know, if you think about Biden's inauguration, uh, calling for unity, feeling that this nation wants to be brought back together, at least 
the vast, the, the considerable majority of, of the nation and that we're going to be able to get things done again. And I, I really thought it was the right time to talk about renewal. I also, you know, we are five years from 2026, where, which will be our 250th anniversary, the anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, there, if you just, if you did a word cloud, you know, of probably the first three months uh, or four months of the administration, you'd see a lot of renewal or words like it, you know, a sense of a, a new beginning, uh, coming back on, on track, being able to do things. So it felt, it felt right. Um, you know, in September when it published, um, you know, it, it, a lot of things obviously had stalled and, and then it published right after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was just horrific. Uh, regardless of what you thought of the original decision um, and then now. Uh, but I would say at no point have I not been aware that this is a counter narrative. Indeed, the preface starts with we've been living through five years of continual crisis. It's also though your your belief in America and Americans capacity for introspection, for for radical honesty at the individual level, at the community level. And I think part of what has been disappointing about the past eight or nine months is recognizing how many new people actually do not have that appetite for radical honesty, um, how many people do not feel that they are responsible for this moment of reckoning. Yeah, yeah. And I will say candidly, I, you know, three or four years ago, I would have been sympathetic and I certainly, I wouldn't have mind taking, I, I would have supported taking down Confederate statues, but I don't think I would have owned the responsibility in the way I do today. And a lot of that is the work of people like ta Coates or Nicole Hannah-Jones, just showing the legacy of, uh, of slavery, but of course, many, many policy decisions made in the Great Depression and made in my lifetime. So there, there, there is, is that. Um, I want people, I want to reframe this debate. I want to say to people that it takes strength and courage to do this, that only a great nation can really do this. There are plenty of nations who will not face their past, who have, you know, uh, all sort of gussied up, slick national narrative. Most of them are not democracies. Uh, but even among democracies, it takes a lot. Now, you know, the Germans did, they were forced to. The South Africans have, and um, in all these countries, you'd probably say not enough. The South Africans, you know, through what was nearly a revolution and an extraordinary leader uh, were able to do that. But I want to say this is a, a matter of strength and courage and it is a form of patriotism. You know, I, I talk about patriotism in the book. I, in this sense, the book is sort of doesn't really fit the, the standard progressive left narrative of reckoning, although I believe strongly in reckoning. Um, I think many, many there are uncomfortable with even the words of patriotism. And I, I talk about James Baldwin and he, he said, I love my country so much that I reserve the right to criticize her perpetually. I, and to the right, and again, I grew up in Virginia in the 1960s. I've got old family in North Carolina, many of whom did enslave people. I can live in that world and I can talk to a lot of those people because I grew up with them. One of the places I start is I love this country, but here's what I think this country has to do to live up to our own ideals. So that it is a debate that is framed within what has been good about us, what can be good about us, and a debate that insists that this is one of the hallmarks of being a strong and courageous democracy. I wanna to talk to you about a number of things, including um, critical race theory. I want to ask you about paid family leave. There are so many, <laughs> so many issues that, that, that fall into this, but before I do, I want to, I want to touch on January 6th, because I think one of the, the meta narratives of January 6th is that, as you say, like we, as a nation are, are we ready to 
to grapple with the reality of the civil war? Are we ready to grapple with, um, you know, the the origins of our country? Are we ready to grapple with how much did or did not change during the civil rights era? We're not ready to grapple with what happened on January 6th, or we have elected officials who are not ready in real time to be honest about what happened. And for me, perhaps in my own naivete, it's not simply in, in the rewriting of it years later. It is just eye-opening to watch in real time an effort to gaslight Americans about what did and didn't happen, why it happened, who was responsible. Yes. Um, and frankly, even you know, at, immediately after January 6th, I thought, okay, you know, okay, you've got- This McC is it, this right. is it. You've got like, McConnell. we keep asking, where's rock bottom? Right. This is it. Well, and McConnell saying, you know, really folks who had been perfectly willing to participate in sort of Trump gaslighting saying enough, right? Uh, and, 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 and really calling him out for the responsibility. I mean, we've seen all that. Um, who then go back to- saying whatever whatever to hold on to power. And we have to fight that. But part of what I'm trying to get at is, you know, as long as that we, as long as it is totally divided into red America and blue America, and increasingly, you know, those and those two parties are further and further apart one side is not going to win and in fact i'm i'm terrified that we're just going to keep alternating which is and of course it even if the republicans were to win not the republicans i, I still don't that the trump sort of base and that part of the the republican party were to win in 2024 and and uh then somebody else the dems win again in 2028 um even that, so assuming democracy survives, is we just can't keep doing that. There has to be a different narrative. And you know, one of the things I also fight fiercely for, because it's going to be essential to get there, is ranked choice voting, an electoral system that allows us to have more than two parties, because we are not fully represented and there's no way to break, it's very hard to break out of this. And we're, we're you know, if you look at the electorate, you're just constantly on a knife edge. So at the same time that I do believe, yes, you have to fight this, you have to fight for the truth, you've got to hope that the courts will hold, uh, you have to believe that there is truth. I also think there have to be a lot of efforts to try to find ways to, to tell a different narrative of the, of the country that is less about, we're going to force you uh, sort of as a political act, the left versus the right, and more, as I said, a story about what it takes for this country to move forward. And I do think there are, there are, you know, even if I do look at the people I grew up with, there are people who, who are not as prepared to reckon with our history as I am, but who see it very differently. And your generation, I place a lot of hope in, even ac across the political divide, because I think many of you have been raised in, you're in a different America. Your America is heading for a plurality nation in which there, there isn't a we that is a, a white we. I mean, it's not the majority. Thank you for referencing the millennials. Thank you for the, <laughs> the shout out as we begin to be uh, overcome by, by the Zoomers who mock us for our side parts and our, our skinny jeans. There's, there's a really good question here from, from Jason Lauren who asks, um, I think this fits in nicely here, how you're processing the wave of congressional departures of moderate Republicans. I mean, Adam Kinzinger particularly yeah. notable in there, um, and 15 Democrats, and the fear of being primaried. How do we reconcile the downslide versus the hope of resiliency of American democracy? So there's a lot in there, but I do think yeah. these, you know, the the wave of, of retirements and such is, is interesting. Yeah, no, I, look, I, 
I'm kind of a split personality here. I mean, I, I spent earlier part of this week working with various people at New America and others who work on political violence. I mean, I think it's it's not just being primary politically. A lot of these folks are scared because of what it means for your family and for yourself to be you know, holding specific positions. I mean, uh, the number of people who are talking about having gotten death threats and their that, school board, their volunteer school board members were resigning for the same reason. Exactly. And that, so on the one hand, I, I really do believe we have to take the threat of, of political violence very seriously. We have to hope that, you know, our police forces uh, will hold. This is not a great moment there, uh, but that you have to, to assume, as did happen in November a year ago. It, you didn't see it in January 6th, but remember a year ago, it was even the, Mich the Republican Michigan legislators who were supportive of stuff in Michigan politics that I was horrified at would not certify the election for Trump, right? And obviously the folks in Georgia. And I do believe there are people in the courts, there are people in the, in, the, um, in the justice system and law enforcement and definitely in our military who will, if it comes to violence, stand for uh, the rule of law. But I'm not taking it for granted and I, I am deeply worried. And so on the one hand, you have to recognize probably politically it may get worse before it gets better, at least at the at the local level and, and at, the, at the house level. Um, and again, I do believe the only way out of this long term is to have ranked choice voting or multi-member districts, ways in which you can you those moderate Republicans can create their own party and people can vote for that party without tipping the race to the Democrats, because that's the problem, right? They would not be where they are, but they're not going to go all the way over to the Democrats. They voted for Biden, but many of them didn't vote for, for Hillary against Trump and vice versa, because there are more conservative Democrats who are not happy. We're, we're seeing this. Uh, and you know, my colleague Lee Drutman has written extensively about this. For most of the 20th century, we had liberal Democrats, conservative Democrats, liberal Republicans, they were pretty much in the same place, New England Republicans uh, and liberal Southern Democrats and then conservative Democrat, uh, conservative Republicans. Uh, so they were four parties and they compromised on a lot of stuff. And now we have two parties and they're further apart and our electoral system is driving them further and further apart. Do you wanna talk about critical race theory? Sure. Um, I don't even know how to frame the question because I, without giving into this bizarro premise that doesn't exist, right? It's it's not being taught in elementary schools. Um, it's, and, but it has become a catch-all, I think, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, or for any type of um, history that allows a more accurate and critical rendering of America's past, which is why, of course, in the context of what you are suggesting is necessary in order for this renewal seems really relevant. I think the resistance kind of speaks for itself, right? The resistance to it, which I think in part is about, you know, parental choice and individual choice. I think that gets baked in. And then of course, I think it is just part of this much bigger resistance to a changing America. Yes. And, and, you know, we don't have evidence of any country that is a, dem a democracy when this has been done forcibly many times, but we've never seen a democracy move from a, a, not only a majority, but a substantial majority for most of its history of one race or ethnicity that then that majority loses the majority uh, and is, is then does not have the power to impose what it wants. We've never seen that happen. We're gonna see that happen a lot in this, in this century. Britain is supposed to go, most people call it majority minority. I call it a plurality nation because I just don't think it makes sense to say everybody's a minority. <laughs> there are different pluralities. That's a very, very scary thing for an awful lot of people who really do feel like their country, their culture is being you know, taken over and they are being displaced. It's a real thing and it's a really hard thing for, for many folks. 
two things I think will, will help us get out of it. One, as I said, is the younger generation has grown up with this uh, and does not have the same kind of reflexive white supremacy. But the other is, it, I do think it's true that you can't have white people feel like there's nothing good about them or their history. That's ridiculous. And it's no way to change, right? If you, if this is basic therapy. If you just hate yourself, you are never going to be able to make the change you need. So part of what I am talking about, I have a whole chapter on both and, right? Where you really do face your history and you're totally honest about it, radically honest, but you also see plenty of good things, right? That, that you know, Thomas Jefferson enslaved people lived because, I mean, he had his lifestyle because Monticello, as Clint Smith writes, was a plantation. And um, we don't talk about it as Monticello plantation. I grew up there. I grew up in Charlottesville. I could give you a tour. Uh, I went there so many times as a, as a kid. Uh, you know, all of the hypocrisy uh, and the, the sexual relations and the, the enslaving his own children, there's all sorts of terrible stuff there. And he knew a lot of it. He is still also the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And those words have inspired not only millions and millions of Americans, but millions of people around the, the, the world. And he and his fellow founders did actually create a nation with a vision of a far more equal society, even though it's radically unequal by today's standards. So to me, you again have to find a way to find both and accept both and then develop a common narrative that says, you know, we're, we are strong and brave for, for being able to do this. And we have to, you know, everybody gets their say. You know, I might disagree. I, I was a, a law professor when Kim Crenshaw first wrote that article. Yeah, and the idea that it's gonna be taught in grade school, it was advanced legal theory. But, you know, I might not agree with everything she'd say, but I want a country where she has her say and that her, her vision of what is happening is just as valid as mine. We're also going to start teaching tort reform in the second grade. Um, <laughs> Jason, who's back with another question, um, which, is, which is about what, when, when you imagine us shifting the narrative, um, I think there's a question of both who is the we that's shifting mm -hmm. the narrative and also this is I think we get into a little bit of think tank do and think tank land which is what is the forum for that dialogue and as Jason notes the media doesn't seem to be it no so I'll just say I, and I write about it I am involved uh, with a number of people in an effort called uh, us at 250 or us at 250 uh, the, the, the double meaning is intentional, that our goal is to engage as many organizations and people as possible in reimagining a country that is big enough to hold us all. And we think we need lots of young people and there are many ways to reach them and we are working with people in entertainment we think faith groups are gonna be very important uh, to, and we are working with faith groups. Uh, we, we think business is going to be important. We wanna challenge people to say, okay, we've got five years to the end of 2026. What is the country you wanna live in in the next 250 years? And how do we start now? It's not gonna happen by 2026, but it is going to be this inflection point between a white majority uh, nation and a plurality nation. And at, at a time where history and po our, the nature of our political system and the, the nature of our social welfare system, all of that is up for grabs. So instead of fighting in the well-rehearsed lines, I won't say instead of, it won't be instead of, in addition to, because that show's gonna go on, how can we work more at the local level and the state level to find a common vision uh, that is not all harmony? That's crazy. It's going to be deeply, um, a lot of contests, deeply con contested, but we all believe that, we, that that's a vision worth fighting for, a country big enough to hold us all. And the forum is not Washington think tanks. 
the forum has to be the way I think about it. Like Obama ran his campaign with my Obama. He had a uh, he had a container uh, and he had language and he had graphics uh, and he had a lot of ideas. But local parties at the state level and the local level, they fill that container with how they wanted to do it. And that's how we imagine it. I think we've seen in the last few few months and years how powerful also just local community and local oh, government yeah. c can be when it when it comes to applying some of these concepts. So let's talk about paid family leave and all of the other child care <laughs> policies yeah, yeah. that are. I mean, listen, there is so much in Build Back Better agenda that is going to radically reshape things for parents, for caretakers, for families. So we can talk about that. But I really can't believe we're still talking about paid family leave. <laughs> like how, how did this become the sticking point? Tell me about my own naivete. Well, so I'll, I'll pull age on you, not rank, but age. <laughs> I mean, so when I wrote why women still can't have it all in 2012 paid family leave was something a very small number of very dedicated groups had been pushing for decades uh, right family values at work the women's law center i mean there were there were a few but it was nowhere in the in the national discourse uh, nor was the idea of an infrastructure of care. As far as I know, Ai-jen Poo had, had started talking about an infrastructure of care in the late aughts. And probably if you go back to feminist economists uh, and sociologists, they'd, they'd been writing about what were then all women's issues forever. And it wasn't really in the national dialogue. So I actually think that given you know, from 2012 to today, and Biden has a whole care agenda, and he runs on a care agenda. And he doesn't just say these are women's issues or mother's issues, right? They're parental. But more importantly, we've managed to put them together with caring for your parents, not just caring for your children. I mean, paid family leave is for your children, but the rest of the, the package is for care of all different kinds or for disabled family members or for or simply sick family those who, are, who need our care. So from that point of view, there's, that's a lot of political change very quickly. Well, and, and, I, and I would add over to that the fact that they've applied a racial justice lens given that the vast majority or disproportionately the women who provide care in the care economy are Absolutely. women of color, immigrant women. Absolutely. And part of what's driving that also is that my generation, uh, you know, I was born in 58, which is the peak of the baby boom. So as I age, that's the biggest cohort in the, among the boomers. And we're all thinking about, wait a minute, wait till we need that care and who's going to be caring for us. And we want those people to have good wages and good jobs. You know, it, it, right. it especially is, because your, your millennial children are all saddled with so much student loan debt and, that you already know they will not be the ones yes, well, that. working out that my money. Kids are, my kids are not even remotely close to being able to pay it back. So, so no, I, I accept that, that too. But so I do see a lot of progress. I see remarkable progress in the way we're talking about it and the way we're thinking about it in terms of, are we investing? Can we care for one another? It's actually a deeply pro-family policy, which is also something that traditionally was, that was the domain of the right. And I now in many ways think Democrats are the party of family. Why paid family leave? That one, why that specific issue does baffle me. I mean, it, it the only explanation I can come up with is that in the end, there's still this belief that, you know, your wife should be at home, you know, so if she doesn't have a job, she doesn't need leave. But that is so insane, given that Americans, even with two incomes, have a hard time making a decent living. I, I can't, that I cannot explain. Well, Why that and, one that and I, I would augment that with, I've, I also thought the, the, the public bullying of Secretary Buttigieg was also a reminder that there is a lot of bias. You can give men a policy where you say you have this time with your family and that there's still a bias that they shouldn't be taking it because they're essentially on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Which if you have been up with the newborn, you know. <laughs> well, that will cure itself. The more family leave there is and the more men take it, 
uh, and the more, more men actually take it, uh, that would the, the idea that it's not work will quickly uh, d disappear. I think there's a lot in all of this that does go to traditional ideas of masculinity. And it doesn't, you don't have to say it's toxic. It's just this, the, you know, we still, the dominant image of the manly man is not a dad. It may be a provider, yes, but it's not a dad who is actively engaged, which is just terrible for men because men, I mean, men, women, everyone benefits from actually being needed and from from the you know the the care relationship goes both ways you're caring for somebody but you, you know yes you're exhausted and i know you're in the middle of a lot of it but you know what how you grow um if only because i'm constantly telling my kids to do things and then thinking you know i don't do that i should <laughs> but but so i just think men lose out there but i i do think we don't have a really positive image of manhood that a lot of people, that men and, and those of us who raise men um, can, can cohere around in the way that the, that still strong, silent workaholic rules. I'm gonna ask you to put on your, somewhere between your media critic hat and your um, political analyst hat, which is, I. I grapple a lot as a member of the media with the ways in which we cover the former president and the former administration, because there is a fine line between accountability and the necessity of accountability and um, and transparency about where he is and what he's doing and the funds he is raising and the objective of those funds and just giving him oxygen and air. And having learned our lesson um, from from what transpired in in the previous four or five years, and so I wonder from where you sit, what that should look like, how how you thread that needle, and for Democrats too, because the truth is, you know, it's, he he is still he still raises money on a fundraising email, he still persuades some people to get out and vote. Um, there's that push and that pull. That's such a hard- The eye roll really says it all. I mean, you could just do the eye roll and then be done. <laughs> it's just so hard. I mean, I, I, you know, I, it's so hard because so much of what is wrong with us is that we have completely different narratives. So we find, you know, the liberal press, or I would just call it the free press, the, the press that is committed to truth, um, you know, has to try to cover more than just one political side. And then, but then yes, you, as you said, you're, you're providing oxygen. I do think that toward the end of the, the Trump administration and the beginning of, of this administration, well, maybe take a cue from Biden, right? Who's keenly aware of what's happening and he's trying to speak to all Americans, but is doing it in a way where he addresses the issues and the dangers of the issues without focusing on the man. So I, that's at least, seems to me a reasonable compromise. In other words, you can talk about the ending of you know the the attacks on voting rights. You can talk about the all the disinformation around the vaccine. All of that without tying it to a Trump agenda or, or, you know, and yes, you have to report that he's raising money, but do we report on all candidates that are raising money? We should do it in the same way we would anyone else. Just That'll be my F block from now. And I'll just bring out a filings every quarter to be like, let's see who's, <laughs> who's raised what, uh, who are the big thinkers you follow? Who, who are you looking to who's shaping your thinking um, how do you keep from, I don't know, like all the music I listen to is from the nineties. And I worry sometimes about my intellectual sphere becoming the same where I'm like, well, it's the same people I've been following for the last 10 years. Yeah. There's so many. Um, so I'll, I'll give you two that are related. One is Hilary Cottam, who is a British thinker and a designer. She's really a designer. She won designer of the year. 
uh, in 2009, and she wrote a book called Radical Help uh, a couple years ago now, and it is a, it's called Revolutionizing the Welfare State, and it is all about the, the, what Britain got, what Britain left out of creating its welfare state was community engagement. Bever Lord Beveridge, who sort of designed national health and all of their safety nets, he assumed that people would stay involved, that you didn't hand off care to the state. The state provided the framework and funding, but that you really needed to engage individuals in helping one another. And, and she, she actually ran social experiments on everything from unemployment to youth engagement to healthcare. Uh, and, and she designed ways for individuals to get involved. Uh, and she's just given a phenomenal lecture talking about the end of the care home, right? Just wiping out care homes and what could replace it. And she's in the midst of a bunch of really awesome British thinkers. Uh, the um, Kate Rayworth is another who writes about donut economics. How do we live in a way that enables mutual flourishing where we tend that we, we care for one another and for the earth. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, Mariano Mazzucato is another, but I'm gonna relate that vision of care to Heather McGee's vision of solidarity dividends in the, the Sum of Us. Because solidarity, and I write about this in Renewal, I have a chapter called Rugged Interdependence. And I point out that rugged individualism is a very narrow slice of our history, if you really look at it. And that we have lots of traditions of solidarity. What else was the Underground Railroad? What was getting through the depression? Right? There, there's a ton of solidarity that's never been tapped. And some of it is, yes, it's, it's stronger probably in African-American culture. It's always stronger in poorer cultures, but also in Indian American or indeed I'd say Hispanic American families as a very strong tradition. Uh, it's a partly a Catholic tradition. Uh, but that, so when I read Hillary on care, and then I read Heather on race, and then others on, um, there's a woman named Jenna Bednar and Margaret Levy, uh, but these are all people trying to imagine what an economy and a society would look like that privilege not growth for the sake of it, not measured only by income and unemployment, but measured by the health of the units that care for one another, families. But I, I say that because um, I believe in constructed families as well as biological ones. So that, and I read, you know, I read widely. There's always a huge stack of books, but those, it, there's, there are links there that I'm working hard to pull together. I, I really, I, I'm, of course, I'm a nerd, so I've written all of this down, <laughs> but I love that, that Anne-Marie has put it in the chat. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It just saved us all a a Google search. I have one minute left before I get cut off. So I'm going to ask you a question I always ask at the end, which is, what did I miss? So the one thing you missed is I also write about grace mm -hmm. and I write about renewal as a spiritual concept. Uh, and I don't adhere to a particular religion, but I believe strongly in faith. And in all faiths, this idea of renewing your best self, renewing your vows, renewing the covenant, it is a, it, it's like the spring, right? It's, a, it's strong. But to do that, there's also this concept of grace of, of you know, it's not earned, it's given. Uh, and the giver of grace all, often gets grace. But it's a, it's, just a loosening in the joints that, that doesn't rush to judgment so fast, that gives people the benefit of the doubt, that looks for that learning opportunity or that teaching opportunity, rather than immediately pointing the finger uh, and, and you know, then, then moving to a, a, a conversation of blame and fault. I feel like trying to work and live in the middle of a pandemic has, has forced all of us <laughs> to flex that muscle. Henry, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. Alicia, thank you so much. That was a really thoughtful approach to how you uh, walked everyone through the book, especially for those who have not yet had a chance to read it. Uh, I know that they appreciated how you kind of helped unpack. Uh, there's a lot in there. Um, Dr. Slaughter, you've had a just a tremendous career that's really ranged in a lot of different areas. So you bring 
um, I, I was actually watching some of your body language that as Alicia would post some questions to you and there would be almost like you would look up and I could almost see you kind of like scanning uh, some kind of metaphorical, uh, you know, Dewey decimal system of factoids of like, okay, of, of the 16 different ways I could approach um, the spheres of knowledge and influence that you have walked through in your career. And um, so thank you for that. I appreciate the thoughtful uh, answers that you offered as well. I want to give everyone a quick reminder. Uh, Dr. Slaughter is going to be joining us for after hours um, what an incredible opportunity to speak with someone who has um, just had such a front row seat on so much and sits still in a front row seat. Um, if you have suggestions about where this country should go, uh, now is your moment to uh, speak some, uh, perhaps your own truth to power, both in a good and perhaps in a, in a an observant, radically honest way. Uh, so you can uh, come to After Hours, buy a copy of her new book, which is just really fabulous. I love the take that you have uh, taken throughout the book. Uh, come buy a copy, come join us. Um, Alicia won't be able to join us. She's going to get back to her children, which is a really good thing to get back to. And But we do appreciate the time that you've given us so far. Uh, I want to ask one closing out question here, and maybe uh, let's keep an eye on in case somebody else posts something. Feel free to you have another minute or two that if you want to post one more question. I do have one question for you um, that's been kind of sitting with me for a little while as in some of my own reading, and this is for Dr. Slaughter, which is that um, what, what do you imagine as today's anchoring institutions? Uh, you know, once upon a time, there were things like the Elks, Elks Club and, and um, you know, Knights of Columbus fish fries on Friday nights. I'm talking about more. I realize these things still exist, but it used to be more. Uh, I'm thinking about some we posted Robert Putnam twice and kind of yep. his, you know, questions about what does community look like today? Obviously, attendance at, uh, at churches and in different religious institutions, uh, as has been reported over and over again, attendance is down. Um, and so kind of these things that used to be kind of the, the glue of how people had contact with each other, people that they didn't necessarily agree with about every single thing. But nonetheless, there were lots of these points of um, community positive friction, I'll call it, you know, not, in, not friction aggressive against, but more coming together with people who may or may not be like yourself, but you have these opportunities. So I'm wondering today, what do you see as some of those anchoring institutions and what what is your hope? Because I agree with Alicia, it's not social media necessarily, though I think it sits in that spot right now. What do you see as plausible candidates for anchoring institutions? So I don't see existing ones, but I see two very important candidates. I don't see existing ones exactly because of the life Alicia is leading right now. And if she were a single mom, you know, she'd never get out. Um, there's no time, right? I mean, when, when, you know, I, when we were raising our kids, there were all these things I could have been involved in. There was no way I could barely, you know, I was barely keeping my head above water. So I think that's a large part that, and, and for men and women, it, you know, sort of the, the just work and kids, it's, it's enough. And uh, it's, you're lucky if you can see your friends, but the two institutions I have great hope for are community colleges and libraries. Community oh. colleges are hugely important for that continual, you know, re, re learning, uh, sort of adapting. I tell my kids, you know, you, learning to learn, uh, the, sort of being being flexible and adaptable because you're going to have to continually open your mind and learn new things. And community colleges are just hugely important. They are a place where lots of different people come together. Um, and I think they're stronger. And then post office, uh, not post office, libraries, which, you know, you say, oh, well, you have to like books. Not true. Today, libraries are the place that people go to look for job listings. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of librarians doing extraordinary community outreach. So those are the places I would put, put most, most faith. I appreciate both those. I think libraries also uh, a, a center for continuing education as well. Yes. A lot of public presentations, a lot of public gatherings. Um, so uh, right on for both of those. Um, okay, so we're going to close out. We're at eight o'clock, right? We're making the trains run on time. Alicia, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. I hope to have, uh, let, let us know when your next book comes out. We'd be happy to um, hope maybe someday back on a real stage, but we'll we'll take Zoom for a minute as well. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your Thank efforts so for the fan community. 